Uh, all right. Uh, after a couple of some some technical problems, we're online, I think. Um. Okay. Are there any questions from the last lecture? Today we're going to continue our discussion of um, standard model of particle physics, and we're going to wrap it up. We might have to rush the ending, but in the interest of getting to non-perturbative stuff, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to discuss electroweak interactions, uh, but I will review what we went through the standard model for you guys a couple of times. Um, all right. So questions as we go along, ask, please. Standard model particle physics is a renormalizable interacting 4D quantum field theory. It's a gauge theory. The gauge group is SU3C for color. SU2 left for left moving Majorana fermions and U1 Y, Y for hypercharge. This is not to be confused with electromagnetism. The gauge bosons, we're gonna refer to them as G mu alpha as the gluons, eight of them. W mu A as spin one particles that are, the that ended up forming W and Z bosons, and B mu is the hypercharged gauge field that also combined to give uh, Z mu and uh, the, the Z boson and uh, photon. There are three generations of fermions. Here is a summary. Summary. <laughs> summary. There are leptons and quarks. The leptons, M is the generation, nu mu and E mu. So E1 is electron, E2 is muon, and E is tau, tau, and the corresponding neutrinos. The quarks are up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. Uh, the EMs, UMs, and DMs are Dirac fermions. So they could be understood as two pairs of, as a pair of Majoranas, right? So uh, Majoranas like this. So we're going to think of them as left-handed and right-handed Majoranas. But the neutrinos are only left-handed. There are extensions of Stanomol that include other stuff, but this is the most basic thing. Here's the representation theory. The left-handed electron and Majorana and the neutrino sit in an SU2L representation. These are leptons, which means that they're not charged under uh, strong force. One, two minus half, minus half is a hypercharge. Two means fundamental of SU2. The right-handed part, of course, is not charged under anything but the hypercharge. The hadrons, or perhaps I should call these quarks, um, are the left-handed ones are the UM and DMs, right? These are, uh, they have a SU2 left charge. Here's fundamental. One six is the hypercharge, and they're also in the fundamental representation of SU3 color. The right-handed components, there's a pair of them. These are Majoranas. And there are, of course, three threes, two-third, minus one-third. All right, we have the Higgs field, which is a complex scalar field, and is uh, transforming as a fundamental of SU2, and this has charge minus half, right? Um, SU2 left times U1 of Y is the symmetry group that is spontaneously, sorry, gauge group that's spontaneously broken down to U1 electromagnetism. Good? All right, the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian, of course, has the, cannot, the usual terms, uh, Yang-Mills term for SU3 color, SU2 left, and U1 hypercharge. Um, then there are left-handed, so there is the left-handed stuff here. These are the right-handed stuff. Left-handed leptons, right? And these are the right-handed Majoran leptons. Because these are Majoranas, they're coming the left-handed hand, left -handed piece and the right-handed pieces, right? Here's the uh, left-handed quark and the right-handed quarks, Majorans, right? Hopefully the representation theory is clear. Any questions? I'll repeat this several times. So this is the, the, the Lagrangian before Higgs, right? There were a bunch of comments at this level we went through last time. 
all the fermions must be massless, right? Why was that? Yeah, so the a mass term like this will not be, uh, will, will have a hypercharge. So it's not invariant under U1 hypercharge. So they have to be massless and then spontaneous symmetry breaking is precisely uh, what gives us masses to all the fermions, uh, right? Okay. And the gauge bosons, actually, some of them. The, there is a possibility of a CP violating terms. Recall that CP is the same thing as T, because CPT is a symmetry of quantum field theory, four dimensions. So every time we talk about CP violation, we're talking about violations of T. Now, you could have this term. It's a CP violating term. We could add it to SU2 left for SU2 left for U1 hypercharge or SU3. I may I claim that there is no phenomenology. It's not relevant uh, for, for U1 hypercharge and uh, SU2 left. And we only really talk about the strong force uh, CP parameters, right? And that's like uh, this, this is normalization we use for uh, the QCD one. And the observed value of it or the lack thereof is by observation it's been, uh, it, 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 we know that it has to be smaller than 10 to minus nine. That is the strong CP problem that it's not, it's not there. You guys know what, okay, I'll, I'll comment on why I'm saying that SU2 left and U1 hypercharge uh, are not, they don't have observable consequences. There, but in brief, if I want to say, say this, If, uh, if the Lagrangian without this term, now let me let me not come. All right, any any questions? Now let's talk about the Higgs Lagrangian. The Higgs Lagrangian, well, it's a comp complex scalar field that's transforming in one two minus half, minus half is the hypercharge and two is the fundamental of SU2 and it's colorless. So here's the kinetic term. These Ds are decided, these are the covariant gauge derivatives uh, that are decided by the representation I just described to you. There is V of the phi dagger phi that we take to be just a uh, master lambda and then uh, that that's shifted, right? So it's like a quadratic, there is a, five, four, if you wish, term and a master, right? This was the easiest example of potential that showed the spontaneous center breaking we're interested in. We said that we go, it's convenient to do this in the unitary gauge where one of the components of the scalar field uh, in SU2 is set to zero. The other one is you're expanding it around V, V is the vacuum expectation value of the field phi. What's the dimension of it? Hopefully you recall this one, um, H of X is the real scalar field. And then unitary gauge, this weird vertex, well, two point mixing is removed. Good. There are Yukawa couplings, very, very importantly. And we said that Yukawa couplings are in general, not diagonal in generations, right? So we're gonna build on that. They're not diagonal across in, in generations, but okay, yeah. Here's the Yukawa coupling that does that couples the leptons to Higgs. Here's the Yukawa, and these the other terms are coupling the quarks to Higgs. Right? So this is gonna give mass to leptons, and the other terms are gonna give mass to the quarks. Important, yeah. Any questions? All right, the total Higgs action we went through last time. After taking this action and expanding it around the new vacuum, looks like this. So this is the standard kinetic term for the real scalar field. There will be a mass term and for the dimensionalities to work out, there will be V squared sitting here. Notice that lambda is dimensionless. Very important. 
Okay. It's very important that lambda is dimensionless. And it's also important that lambda is small, right? Otherwise, we're in trouble. Higgs is not perturbative. So Vs and lambdas, like basically Hs come with Vs every time you're in these kind of expressions. So uh, there is a term V plus H squared that describes, gives mass to the W boson, right? This is a complex vector boson. And then there are the other combination. There, there is a, uh, well, this is the other term that has the, uh, um, it has a Z boson uh, and uh, um, can't talk, a photon in it. Now, here are the uh, terms that the Yukawa couplings that basically give mass to the leptons and quarks and also give us vertices for their interactions of Higgs with those guys, three-point vertices. Any questions about this Higgs action? All right. We talked about the spectrum, spectrum of Poincaré group. The representation, e reps of them are uh, classified by spin and mass. Spin zero, Higgs is the only thing we've got. The mass is two lambda uh, v squared or two mu squared. That is a simple case. Then we have the W mu A bosons. We said that M1 squared, and so there's a mass, right? That's generated. The W mu one and W mu two end up with the same mass. This is not a coincidence. It's pointing to uh, part of the gauge transformation that remains unbroken. We described it, what that transformation is. This is a combination of SU2 left and U1 hypercharge, right? There's a particular combination. The unbroken U1 is, has the following charge Q. It's the electromagnetic charge, which is T3 plus Y. Y is a hypercharge and T3 is the third component of SU2 left. And the gauge transformation that does that is omega one equal omega two, three. So this three up means that it refers to the third component. This two refers to SU2 and this one refers to SU1. Uh, to, to U1. All right. So this is the structure of spontaneous image breaking from SU2 left U1 hypercharge down to U1 electromagnetic field. We we rearrange our degrees of freedom into the W complex W boson, W plus minus, defined this way, and then the Z boson and the photon. So these SW and CWs are cosine signs that we've defined for theta w. Questions? Do you guys remember what theta w was? It was just g1 over square root g1 squared plus g2 squared and vice versa, g2 is the other one. Good. All right, I'm, I'm going a little bit too fast. Any questions from here? We have the spin half particles, the fermions. They get their masses from the Yukawa coupling and we could write them in terms of the Dirac fermions in the following form. These are the... Uh, Leptons. These are the um, these are the uh, quarks. Quarks, right? V has to sit there. You could expand this. You get you get this form. Why don't I have a mass for neutrinos? Because it's S two L, so the right parts. Yeah. Well, you can go through it. I, I trust you. All right, so now, actually, I, I need to explain a little bit more here. Let's go through this. So I said that these, oh, 
these FMN, GMN, and HMN were general and they were not diagonal in generation. I said I can diagonalize them, but turns out that you could really, you can only diagonalize them for leptons and not for quarks, right? And that fact you cannot diagonalize them for quarks is the reason for the introduction of something called the CKM matrix that we're going to discuss. So that's going to be a big part of the discussion today, right? So I just remind you how the diagonalization works. You can do it for leptons, not for quarks. Yep. All right, are we good? So let's remember the mass basis for fermions. There, here's a Yukawa coupling, right? In terms of the uh, leptons, EM, and this Curly thing, this is the right-handed, this is the left-handed, uh, these are the quarks, right? They're emission conjugates. If you want to diagonalize this, you introduce these unitary matrices, UMN, E, UMN, D, and uh, sorry, U, M, N, E, this is U. <laughs> U, M, N, U, and U, M, N, D. So U, M, N, U, M, N, E, they diagonalize the leptons, right? The left-handed ones. U, M, N, U, they diagonalize the up quarks, and these guys diagonalize the down quarks, right? Now, if you want this cancellation to happen, you have to do the same thing for these curly versions, right? With some VMNs, and you pick these guys to be star of each other. Not the complex conjugation, star. Sorry, not, not Hermitian conjugate, but complex conjugate of each other, right? And you could explicitly check that it all works out. You could diagonalize them. Once you diagonalize them, you get F, E, F, U, F, tau. This is the indirect notation, the, the masses you get. You get masses F, M for, elect, uh, for leptons, U, M's, and D, M's for quarks. There are no masses for neutrinos, right? This is something I can do in the Yukawa part of the Lagrange. If I can do the same thing to the kinetic term, and the kinetic term also nicely rotates, I'm good, right? This is a refield redefinition that's allowed. Turns out that you could do that. The kinetic term for the leptons is okay, but kinetic term for uh, quarks is not okay. I'll, I'll go through that, right? The reason is the following interactions. So when we expand in spontaneous symmetry breaking, what we find are terms like this. So you see here, U, E, U, U, and U, D, they rotate these guys, but this is D, M, M, U, M, M, E, M, M. Here you have the coupling of the W plus minus boson is off diagonal. It couples D, M to U bar M. Right? This guy, you're rotating by this matrix, this guy, you're rotating by this matrix. That's the issue. You have two different matrices here. One of them is diagonalizing these, but these do not mix with U's in your diagonalization, right? You're only diagonalizing these within the generations. Similarly for, for, for these guys. We'll see the importance of that. I'll, I'll make it a lot more explosive by expanding the kinetic term. Yeah. And because leptons want to mix with themselves, so to say, that's why they have no problems with uh, diagonalization. So here, here, the problem comes from the fact that you have two different matrices, right? Because mm -hmm. there are two pairs of Majoranas, right? But for, for leptons, you only have one matrix, right? So there's, not, there's no conflict. If you had right-handed neutrinos, you might have been more worried about things. Actually, the whole that story is still understood, and it's, there's a beautiful story over there. But 
we're not going to go there. We're just talking about the, the, the usual minimal standard model. All right. So you will see explicitly that in the kinetic term for the leptons, you could rotate things and it's all good. For the kinetic term, uh, in the kinetic term for quarks, there will be terms that couple D and uh, use, right? And those diagonalizations we can't, won't do you any good. Can you explain why you don't have the exercise this I'll go through it. I'll, I'll explain Well, no, you have terms like this for fermions as well, but there's no master. So the issue comes from the fact that the eigenstates of mass are not the same basis that interact uh, the gauge boson, right? You cannot simultaneously diagonalize them. And what is canonically nice is to diagonalize in the mass eigenbasis, because that those are the nice degrees of freedom. For the leptons, we just there, there is no mass term for the right-handed stuff, right? For the neutrinos. So we just diagonalize this guy. We want to maximally diagonalize things, right? We'll we'll see that. I'll I'll be very explicit about the CKM matrix. Recall, I said the the point of this lecture. I want you guys to walk out of this lecture with a bunch of key properties. The one important thing is that the coupling of W boson, right? The the W plus minus mu. This will lead to lead to flavor changing in quarks, not leptons, right? So it will be a vector like this and some w mu plus minus right whatever it is and now that for quarks the flavor can change but not for leptons and that is described using this matrix called the ckm matrix that's point number one this is related to cp violation that's point number two and uh well, actually, yeah, there, there's more, but we'll see. This is something that I want you guys to know for now, but we'll, we'll go through it and explain in detail. Any questions? I'm still reviewing the stuff from last lecture. So we said that for hadrons, for SU3 color, the theory confines, it becomes strong at 500 MeV, right? Uh, what was that? And the other energy scale that was important? It was the... Sorry? 250 GV. Yeah, 250 GV, and that is the time scale. Well, that's the energy scale for spontaneous symmetry breaking of SU2, right? SU2 left. It was important that that, well, we're going to comment on that. All right. So we're below, at lower energies, the theory confines, so we deal with color singlets. We call these hadrons, right? Bound states of only gluons, they're called glue balls. Bound states of uh, uh, quark, anti-quark are mesons, right? I mentioned three of these famous ones, pi plus, pi minus, pi zero. And then there are bound states of three or more quarks. They're called baryons, famously proton and neutrons. Yeah. So one question that I have was, uh, for example, the, the lambda QC is, let's start with lambda QC. It's G. So what what what's this you mean this, this guy is? Yeah, that number is calculating that about the about that energy scale my theory, the Q C is effectively uh, at that energy scale is deeply in the non-perturbative regime. Lambda Q C D is usually the confinement deconfinement phase transition scale. That's we can't calculate these things. <laughs> right. So all that we could do, well, we could try to calculate it. Yeah, numerically, we could try to well, also there. Are, there's observations, right? There's the physics that we could observe, but the, the energy scale that comes out for uh, confinement is around 500 and maybe. Like say, for example, the mass of the is 900 and Yeah, it's about it's about one GV. Yeah. Okay, it's about the like confinement uh, scale. Correct. So I would like expect there to be more bound states about. No, no, no. <laughs> if that just means that 
the mass of the proton, well, a proton could be sitting at rest, sitting at rest all the time, right? Well, at, at one GV, you have enough energy to pair create these guys, right? But at that energy scale, you don't need to pair create protons. You could pair create individual quarks and your know, antiquarks, yeah. right? So the, the bound energy, the binding energy is very, very large, but that doesn't mean how much energy you have available, right? The bind we have protons right now. We're definitely not dealing with energies around one GV. Right in this room, we do not deal with that energy. If you had one GV, you can tear apart a proton. Okay, any other questions? All right, so the Higgs couplings. The Higgs Higgs couplings are, of course, H4 and H3, like this. I'm organizing everything so that it looks like mass over V. Right, that's the structure of it. The Higgs fermion and Higgs boson have a very similar form. Mass of the fermion over V, F bar F H. There are nine Dirac and three Majorana. The uh, neutrinos are massless. As I said, all particles couple to Higgs as M over V, which and V is 246 GV. So it tells you if you want perturbative control, particles better be I better have small mass. So mass of top is the largest one. It's 173 GV, and things are bad already at that scale. Yeah. So here it is. Here are the masses, right? Neutrino, uh, sorry, electron is half MeV. Muon is 105 MeV. And tau is uh, 1.7 GV, right? And you see the, the uh, quarks as well, and all of those. Guys, right? Is there something I want to comment on here? Uh, you you notice that the W plus minus and Z are very heavy. That's expected, right? Because V goes in there. Three generations of fermions, the representation theory is here, right? You see the hypercharges and everything. Why Left on the all so massive. Sorry? Why is the top one, top one so massive as compared to everything else? Who knows? It is what it is. Right? It's a coupling that's large. Which coupling is it? This is, we're talking about the size of F, G, and H. It's actually not very large. It's larger than the other ones. Yeah. All right. Electroweak interaction. So now we're starting the new stuff. There will be the self-coupling of the gauge bosons and the coupling of the gauge bosons to other particles. By gauge boson, I mean the W and Zs and uh, photon. This was the, uh, the Yang-Mills term we started with. We split this into W mu plus minus Z mu and A mu. This is the W boson, Z boson, and photons. And I have to invent notation for their corresponding field strength. So W mu nu plus minus is the field strength associated with this guy, Z mu nu and F mu nu. Good. So these are the corresponding field strength. Now there are in Yang Mills, if you remember, there was there were the cubic interactions and quartic interactions. Cubic interactions were controlled by G times F, right? F, A, B, C, the structure constants. Here, what are the structure constants? Epsilons. And so basically, yeah. And uh, G is G. And then the second order is G squared epsilon, two of them, right? Okay. So we're for the cubic, cubic terms, we're going to get W, W, gamma, W, W, Z. Those are the cubic terms that we're going to get. Okay, let's see explicitly. W, W, gamma is going to be I, G, two, sine, theta, W. W plus minus, W minus, so this is the field strength, right? And two gauge fields. This is the field strength of W, minus, w plus. This is perhaps the most 
clear use of it, right? So this is the W minus, this is the field strength W plus, and this is the photon, right? Hopefully these are clear. Good? Yeah. So Peter W was essentially uh, making Z and gamma time. He, yes. Sorry. Uh, Theta W was making what? Yeah, so it was the difference between, no, Z and photons are always diagonal for any theta, right? Uh, sorry. And these guys are always uh, diagonal, right? Uh, theta W tells you if Theta W were zero, your spontaneous symmetry bracket, you U1 hypercharge would have been just U1 a photon. So it tells you how diagonal is this the, the remaining U electromagnetic, how, how you embed U1 electromagnetic inside SU2 left times U1, right? So it's about that. That's the angle. Good. All right. The quartic term. Okay. Are, are there any questions about the structure? So you can hopefully see that there is a, there is a derivative. There's one derivative, right? Three three gauge bosons come together. There's a derivative, and that's not surprising. There was always a derivative in these in the third order term. And Yang Mills, the quartic term is W four of these guys, WWZZ, WW photon photon, WWZ photon. These are all we've got. And they look like this term. And these guys, these guys are what they look like. All right. Hopefully this is just a few lines of algebra I can follow. Here, of course, there are no uh, field strength anymore. So there are no derivatives anymore. These are just four of these guys coming together. And you know that by dimension counting. All right. Now, staring at this, one important thing is every A mu, every photon vertex comes with the coupling G2 sine theta W. So G2 sine theta W deserves to be called the electric charge of the particle, right? Because that's how it interacts with photon. The vertex with photon is what electric charge is. So that's the electromagnetic charge Notice that all of these interactions are written down. They separately preserve C, P, and CP, otherwise known as T. Hopefully, you can go back to the your notes from QFT1 and see how C was transforming, P was transforming, and so on and so forth. C was basically swapping particles and antiparticles, right? Anyway. Um, all right, so here's where the origin of the CKM matrix is. All right, so let's go through this a little bit slow. Remember the kinetic term for leptons, these two guys, right, and quarks. This is the lepton that's, uh, sorry, yeah, these are the leptons that are left-handed. So they're SU2 left charge, charged, and these are not SU2 left charged. Right, this funky E means not SU2 lecture. And these are quarks. So these are these are left-handed SU2 charged, not SU2 charged. All right, let's expand them. So I'm gonna first expand this guy. <clears throat> so the left-handed dude. Let me let me clarify what I'm expanding. I'm expanding this in the first line. And then I'm expanding this guy in the second line here. 
All right, so let's focus on the first term. The first term, this is the left-handed thing. So a left-handed part of uh, electron and the neutrinos sit in a doublet, SU2 left doublet. And here is the corresponding action of the covariant derivative. I'm just dropping all the derivative part, right? The covariant part of it is what I'm writing down. Good. Now you immediately notice that B mu and W mu, they take EMs to EMs, they interact EMs and EMs, and nu, nu's and nu bars. But these guys switch. They take neutrinos to electron, right? They, they will introduce interaction between neutrinos and electrons that are not antiparticles of each other, right? But because neutrinos are not mass, are, are massless, we could diagonalize the very first term, right? Because there's no there's no Yukawa coupling to, to worry about over there, right? So we just diagonalize it and we could take care of this, these terms. But here, we can no longer do that. For this term, by the way, this is W minus, this is W, this is W plus, this is W minus, right? So the charged current, which is W plus, W minus, is takes U's and takes them to D's and vice versa. And now we've used our diagonalization. When we diagonalize in the mass basis, we can no longer do that. So it's only the W mu plus minus so-called charged current that is flavor changing, not the Z and B. Right? We're going to diagonalize in these bases so that these terms are good. Is, is, is this one clear? The rest of the terms go for the right. These are just like, there are, there are just simply no interaction, SU2 interaction. Yeah, so, how do you apply this mixing B and B? Why did you say, uh, can you repeat really why we're not mixing B and B? Like like Sorry, new and e. They are, they are they are mixing new and e. Yeah. But we're gonna diagonalize these guys, right? This is a kinator. Now we have the master. Here we diagonalize these guys. New, there's no master to worry about. We diagonalize. We're done. Here we diagonalize the quarks. Now the master will no longer be diagonal. That's what we're gonna do. Actually, we're gonna diagonalize these guys, and then the master. Well, you'll see is that. Yeah, it's, it's really your interpretation of it, right? One of them, you can get, not get rid of flavor changing. And what, which one is that? That's quarks, right? Here's how it works. We can define these rotations for neutrinos, right? Or, or these, these, these rotations. We get rid of... These terms, so this is the charge current, but for, uh, we've, we've diagonalized, so we defined E primes that diagonalize the mass terms, right? Here we're okay, but here we're left with the so-called CKM matrix. And CKM matrix is the diagonalizer U of D, right? The thing that diagonalizes the mass of downs multiplied by U of U dagger as a matrix. This is the so-called CKM matrix. It's the Kibibo Kobayashi Masakawa matrix. Okay. Uh, I thought like references that you try to diagonalize the kinetic term. Because like we so, said, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all about the interpretation. If you diagonalize the kinetic term, then as the particle propagates freely, it's the flavor changes. Or you could diagonalize in the mass term. Right now, the property is particles propagating. Now you say the W boson when you charge W boson when it hits it, it changes the flavor. The second one is preferred. Why? Because particles are e reps of the Poincaré group, right? Which is mass. But like 
these are alternative things, right? But the point is that flavor changing physics is coming from W boson. W plus minus W boson, right? The charge card as opposed to Z mu. Or photon. Yes. So charge current is W plus this is charge current as opposed to the neutral currents, which are these guys. Good. So this is very, very important. This is the point of it. CKM matrix. These matrices are parameters that needs to be need we need to experimentally fix them. Next to so if just people count the number of degrees of freedom in the stat parameters in the standard model, a huge part of it comes from these guys. Right? Hopefully it's pretty clear the comparison between the basis that diagonalizes mass and diagonalizes the interaction three-point vertex with W mu. The fact that they don't necessarily match is the reason for flavor changing physics only for quarks and due to the interaction with W mu. Good. Now, some notation. There are various ways to uh, parameterize the CKM matrix. There's something called the uh, standard form. You could label these guys as the, uh, you know, like the mixing between up, down, charge, down, top, down, charge, strange, so on and so forth, right? But it's good to think about them as uh, Euler angles, sine theta ij, cosine theta ij. Why? Because this is a unitary matrix. This is usually how it's parameterized. And the values of them, W1, 2, theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, and theta 2, 3 are these guys. And this is delta 1, 3. So delta 1, 3 is the only phase I've put here. The rest of the parameters are real. Now, something you notice is that all these angles are small. The largest angle is 13 degrees. So, oh, you're talking about this guy? Oh, sorry. No, the, the largest angle in these guys is just 13. These guys are like 0.2 degree. There is no explanation of this standard model particle physics. It's unknown why these, how to, we don't know how to generate these numbers. These are parameters that go into the model and CKM matrix happens to be very close to identity. We do not know why. All right? So experimentally, the mixing angles are like this. Theta 1, 3 is much smaller than theta 2, 3, much smaller than theta 1, 3, 1, 2, much smaller than 1. For some unknown reason, this could be translated to the fact that flavor-changing physics is suppressed. Yes. So I got like you. So we start with the UV uh, S that we have initially, and then we want to go in a basis which diagnoses the mass. The mass yes. Basis. But that should exactly give me the theta as well. No, 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 no. These are these are so those are U's that diagonalize it. Yeah. CKM matrix comes from the difference between U of D and U of U. That's important. The fact that you know, like U of D and U of U are different. See, for the for the fermion, they're just one of them. The only problem comes in. The problem is because you have two sets of Majoranas, right? And they they are not simultaneously diagonal by the same matrix, right? CKM matrix is U of D times U of U dagger. The field redefinitions remain a symmetry. So said differently, U of U of U and U of D are very close to each other. We don't know why. They're very similar. But there's no physics associated with U of U alone, right? That's just filter parameterizations. <clears throat> now, here is funny. 
We preserve CP symmetry if CKM matrix can be made real. By choice of basis, CKM matrix could be made real. Within standard model particle physics, as we describe it, that's the case. Okay? There is no CKM matrix for leptons, which means that the lepton W boson interactions are proportional to G2 alone. There's no other funky CKM matrix in the stuff. And that's called weak universality. If you hear these words, that's what it means. It just means that there's no CKM matrix for leptons. All right. Okay, so let me repeat this. The mixing angles of the CKM matrix are small, right? It means it's a coincidence. We don't know why, but it just means that the flavor changing physics is su suppressed. If the CKM matrix could be made real, we have we are preserving CP. If not, we're not preserving CP. There's no CKM matrix for uh leptons, and that's called weak universality. Yes. What would be we do to make the CKM matrix real? Like it's some kind of transformation or something to preserve the suits. Yeah, it's just like we we're gonna observe. So here, in the notation that I used, these are sine and cosines of thetas. So these are all real. Theta one three is the only phase there, right? Yeah, it's it's well the yeah. If there is a choice, if there is a basis that could make this real, then that that's like you could prove that it's zero. Oh, uh, yeah. That's for three generations. The story changes for a different number of generations. These are all like dependent. These statements I'm making are very dependent on the number of generations, lack of neutrino, right-handed neutrinos, right? This is within this model, which is successful in describing nature around us. And is there any reason why the value of uh, this phase factor is large as compared to the other values? No, no, this is this is a particular basis. I see. There is no physics associated with delta 1, 3 alone. It's a particular basis, right? This matrix is defined up to unitary rotations. Uh, no, if, if you could make it real, CP. So these are like parameters of the theory. The theory will have the CP symmetry if the CK matrix could be made real. Otherwise, it doesn't. The CP violate. I'm not getting into that much because we don't have time. We have to move on. But um, I mean, any standard text on this, even Wikipedia has an extended discussion of this. All right, so let's talk about the neutral current and fermion interactions. These are Z mu and A mu. So hopefully, I describe what uh, CK matrix is. And hopefully I describe why you shouldn't expect any flavor changing physics for the neutral current, right? Because there was it was not taking U and L, it was not mixing U and down, U and D. All right, here are the definitions of Z mu and A mu. Uh, these are the terms that we get for the flavor, sorry, this is flavor diagonal for neutral current interactions between Z mu and uh, double Z mu W, well, sorry, I'm there. Why did I write it this way? No, that's fine, actually. Yeah. So, anyway, so the photon fermion coupling always takes the following form where E which is the electric charge, electromagnetic charge is just G1 cosine theta W, otherwise known as G sine theta W, right? So it's basically G1, G2 over square root of G1 squared plus G2 squared. All right, this is a more elegant way of writing the neutral current interactions. What goes into it is theta W and the electric charge. Sum over the fermions, this is GV and GA, this is gamma five. GV is this combination of the hypercharge and T3. And GA is just a third uh, component of uh, the electromagnetic, uh, sorry, uh, SU2 left charge. This physics is not flavor changing. 
electromagnetic interactions preserve C, P, and T separately. Neutral current interactions violate C and P, but preserve T, otherwise known as CP. Right? So here are the values for all the leptons and quarks. So T3s, you know. I was just in the representation theory. Q, you know. GV and GA are just decided using the sign of, say, the W. So if you're cutting a mouse in your Yes. So it's the. Oh, no, sorry. Neutral. Uh, yeah, well, okay. Yes. So these two are the neutral. Yes, sir. And like you say about the E is uh, G1 or sorry, G2 sign. Yeah. So it's just G1, G2. Well, maybe it wasn't right. G1, G2 over square root G1, 2 plus G2. Good. All right. Any questions? Yeah. We saw when we were writing uh, in the Lagrangian some term for axiom, we saw that it was a uh, term for what? Axioms. We saw, axioms, okay. Yeah, we saw it was a CP violating term. Well, we wrote down terms that look like CP violating, right? And I said that you could add these terms to your uh, model or not. It cannot be a neutral a neutral current interaction because it preserves CP. Yes. So that, that what that means is that is uh well that term is CP violating, right? But this means that well how to describe it. Yeah so CP violation within the standard model of particle physics the only room for is for it that there is is in the quark sector is in the quark sector through the interaction with uh, W mu's, right? So th this is this is the only statement I'll make at this point, right? Let's not worry about axioms or anything of that nature, right? This is the only CP violation, as this is the only room there is for it. So a CP violation is very long. It's like a whole, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty long, long uh, top, um, important topic. Any other questions? Actually, let me let me first summarize standard model first. Uh, I'm going to summarize standard model, and then I'll talk about physics beyond standard. But in summary, here is standard model particle physics. Quarks and leptons. Six of these guys and six of these guys, right? These guys are only left-handed Majoranas. So these guys are only one Majoranas, two Majoranas, two Majoranas, two Majoranas, right? Um. Gluon, photon, W Z boson, uh, Z bosons, and W bosons. The masses are there. You also have the Higgs. These are interactions. These are uh, fermions, right? S equals zero, S equal one, S equal half. Three generations. Right? This is the summary of standard molar particle physics. Here are all the vertices. These are strong vertices, right? they involve gluons. Here are the weak vertices, they involve W and Zs, right? Here are the electromagnetic vertices, CKM matrix is in here, right? Here are the Higgs vertices. This is, these are all that there is to standard molar particle physics in terms of vertices. You remember uh, perturbation theory, hopefully. So you could do perturbation theory as long as the mass of, so all these couplings, coupling to Higgs, right, was controlled by M over V. As long as that coupling is small, you're within the perturbation theory limit. So you can't really treat the clock for not really. So if 
you are working at energies, top factory, they're called. If you're working at energy that just generate tons of top quarks, that physics is borderline non perturbative. <clears throat> Any questions about this? It's a very nice summary of it, but this is all that there is to electromagnetic three forces, any everything but gravity. Modulo a bunch of subtleties that I'll say in a second. Right? Here are all the parameters there is to it. There are 19 of them. These, these masses, you could view them as uh, F, M, G, M, and H, Fs, right? These are the CKM matrix angles. Of course, now, an important fact. You see that here, the masses of these guys are coded in, in MS bar prime. Do you know why that is? And it doesn't flow with the renormalization scale, right? Yeah, we have we have only everything we've said so far was just tree level, right? We said the Feynman diagrams. Now you have to do you have to do loops, right? So mass was a relevant deformation. It's gonna grow. In that case, uh, why is it mentioned only for the quarks and not for the leptons? Do you know why? I'm fine, man. Because these quarks are not found deep in the infrared. Where where is the QCD? Oh, uh, this is a ten to minus nine. The, yeah, theta three. Yeah, less than sorry, less than ten to minus nine. Explicit CP violation. By the way, CP violation physics has been has have has been seen, right? That's all I'm gonna say. And the Higgs boson is one hundred twenty five GB. That's a massive thing. All right. These, you notice that these numbers are small-ish. Okay, so this is the standard model, standard model of particle physics. It explains a lot of things, but it doesn't explain everything. What is not explained in it? Of course, gravity. It's not built to model gravity, so let's just put gravity aside. But what else is it? What evidence do we have that standard model of particle physics as a renormalizable theory is not the whole story? The most important piece of evidence we have in dark matter. Standard from various, from galaxies to early universe, from all sources or all sorts of reasons, we know, as a matter of fact, standard model of particle matter, standard model matter that we just described, is only 5% of the mass energy in the universe. 26% of it is what's called dark matter. It could interact with standard model particles, but it could be very, very weak. It has to be so weak that it goes undetected. Right? So dark matter is going to be normal matter. But not, we just haven't seen it. Now, there, is, there are more direct, well, depending on how you mean, what you mean by direct. But, okay, so we just described, uh, all right, so that's one piece of evidence. The second piece of evidence is something called neutrino oscillations. Imagine if the case of quarks, if we had diagonalized everything in the W basis, as we did for neutrinos, right? We did that because there were no mass. If we had done that, then the mass term would have shown itself in the following way. A quark was just propagating and under its like normal propagation, the flavor would change. So the flavor of the quark would oscillate 
once diagonalized in this other basis that diagonalizes this, right? So now in standard model of particle physics, we diagonalize neutrinos, electrons, like uh, neutrino, neutrinos are detected to be massive, so we diagonalize the electroweak interactions, right? If there was a mass for neutrinos, then it would show itself as neutrino oscillations, flavor oscillation in neutrinos. So a neutrino E goes to neutrino mu, neutrino tau. Neutrino oscillations have been observed ish. Well, have been observed, have been observed, as a matter of fact. There are various sources of it, directly and indirectly, right? One important uh, source of the story is solar mass neutrinos. So in the center of sun, there are processes that generate neutrinos, but these are only neutrino of electron, electron neutrinos. Nothing else is created. The, the interaction that allows us to just produce the neutr electron neutrinos. But in solar neutrinos, we see other types as well. So that's one indication of oscillations. But there are more other, other indications of oscillations. Notice that neutrino oscillations could be explained using mass, right? But need not necessarily, we don't have to necessarily do that, right? Good, are we good? So th that's the story of neutrino oscillations. We've seen them. This occurs if neutrinos have mass. We found, yeah. So you said that uh, this can be explained if neutrinos have mass, but uh, you also mentioned that there are conditions which do not require the Could be. Depending on who so, you talk to, Mike, like. We don't understand particularly well why it's I think the, the wisdom is this people write down uh, equalities or bounds on neutrino masses. Right? Like you could turn phenomenologically, you could turn your data. If it is to be explained using mass terms, right? You could put bounds on neutrino masses. Turns out that the bounds you find are not on individual neutrinos because of the nature of oscillations, it's on the sum of the masses. It's somewhat messed up. But anyway, neutrino physics is like obviously a route to beyond standard model. We cannot, we, we see neutrino oscillations, we cannot explain them, period, right? Actually, they have, they have reasons to believe that the scale, so, so here, here, you could think of neutrino oscillations as a failure of EFT, of standard model particle physics. You could cook up an energy scale at which something must go wrong. That energy scale, there is like long story. We know what it is, unfortunately or fortunately, it's very, very, very high. It has to do with the fact that neutrinos are very, very, very light. So sample is renormalizable and works really, really well for quite a few orders of magnitude. But the mass scale that you get out of this is really like ridiculously large. Is it close to mass scale? It's pretty large. As close to gut scale. So 10 to 14, 13, something. Gut is like 10 to 16 GV, something, something. This is, if you want to read about the seesaw mechanism. So there it goes. Anyway, there's another piece of evidence. Well, there's something to be explained. This is the matter antimatter lack of symmetry. There is more matter than antimatter. This is the baryon asymmetry. We see that around us, right? And we don't know why. Standard molar particle physics has matter, has antimatter in it, right? This statement, this is a statement about the state of the universe. Right? There's quantum field theory. Our state of quantum field theory is not in the vacuum. We see particles, right? We are working in a state, we look around, we see tons of baryons, but not many, we see tons of matter, but not many, not much antimatter, significantly less, we don't know why. It's not a problem to solve for standard model particle physics. It's just something that standard model doesn't explain. There's a choice of state. From the point of view of standard model particle physics, it's a choice of state. Nobody promises it's gonna explain it all, right? But neutrino oscillations are actually problematic. Dark matter is even, well, 
Oops. All right. Now, let's see. Do I have a slide on hierarchy problem? No. But let me let me go off of this. So hierarchy problem is perhaps one of the most, in my opinion, important problems that Santa Mall is facing. So in Santa Mall particle physics, we have the Higgs, right? All right. So when we try to quantize Higgs is a scalar field, real scalar field. So we go back to four dimensional real scalar field. When we try to quantize it, we saw that, well, mass is a relevant deformation. Mass of the Higgs is put in by hand in this model, right? Mass of all the other particles are basically inherited from Higgs spontaneous symmetry wrecking. But mass of Higgs is put in by hand. Now that's a problem. Why? Well, as you, you know, like, as things run in the loops, in particular this one, pt bar, these vertices, they contribute to the mass of the Higgs. And as a matter of fact, they just make it grow, right? So if we see the mass of Higgs to be whatever it is, it must have at very, very large energies, the cutoff scale of EFT of standard model, whatever it is, Planck scale or whatever it is, it must have been absurdly small because it keeps growing. And in low energies, the scale that we work with, we see mass of the Higgs is 250 or 125 GB, right? So 125 GB is the, the mass that we see at, in our low energy physics. If this model is to work out really, really nice up to very, very large scales that we think it does, it means that, that if you define the UV theory at that large scale, the mass over there must have been teeny tiny, like many, many orders of magnitude. This is fine tuning. You see, the issue is this, no symmetry is explaining this, yeah, right? There's no symmetry, spontaneous, there's no, when you see a fine tuning, right? That usually has to do with symmetry. Something must have been zero. It just happens to be a little bit off of zero because of symmetry breaking. But here there's no symmetry, it's scalar field, right? Scalar field, that was the issue we had. There's, there, there's so little symmetry that this is called the hierarchy problem. It is, not a problem per se for the theory, but uh, uh, people, uh, I, I've heard one description of it uh, this way, that if you enter a room and you see a pencil standing on its tip, just like that in the air, it's surprising. Now imagine lots of things on top of that still standing on the tip. That's fine tuning. All laws of physics are okay with that. You just don't expect that initial conditions because that's fine tuning. So this fine tuning is insane. <laughs> it's like many, many, many orders of magnitude. There are smaller fine tunings within standard model of particle physics. They're not disastrous, but this one is like pretty bad. So I'm just gonna say one thing. Do you have any thought on how could we cook up a model that will get rid of these terms. So a hint, this is a fermionic loop. Comes with a minus one, right? If I could cook up, if I had the boson going around, it would come with plus one. If I had a symmetry in the theory that required for every fermion, there exists a boson of the same mass, it would cancel exactly that that symmetry would have protected the mass of the Higgs. That is one of the motivations for supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a construction <clears throat> that you could put, you could enlarge, uh, you could enlarge your uh, standard model to a minimal supersymmetric standard model, and it will, it will solve this issue. It protects that. Now you have to have other issues, right? So you have to break the supersymmetry because we don't see it. Right, we look at the mass of the fermions and bosons, they do not have the symmetry, so you have to break it at some scale. It changes the early universe cosmology, lots and lots of things. All right, so hopefully, with this, we wrap up the discussion of standard molecular particle physics. Here are all the parameters, here are all the Feynman diagrams. Here's the matter content it's a gauge theory SU3C times SU2 left times U1 hypercharge.
spontaneous loop working to uh, SU3C that confines in the IR times U1 electromagnetic. And the W tells you about how off the angle this thing working is. But there are gazillion other parameters. Uh, for the most part, the, the parameters that matter are G1, G2, G3, couplings of the gauge fields, right? This theta parameter, V, right? The uh, 250s, 249 or something, whatever. <laughs> so there is the scale that takes this breaking, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then the CKM matrix and FMGMHMs. That's it. That's all we've got. All of these could be written that way. Hopefully, you could reproduce all of this in your head, right? But this is what this is an elegant theory. There aren't many parameters in it, and it describes everything. Um, this is the end of Sano model. We're going to wrap it up here, and we will move on back to we'll move back to quantum field theory, and talk about anomalies. So that's going to be the next part. part. But importantly, one of the examples are going to be that we're going to see there is no anomaly in standard model particle physics. We're going to work that out, right? So that's a quantum feature. All we did here was just, even though I drew five diagrams, right? But the only comment I made about loops was this, right? I just said, believe me, it's normalizable. All right. Any questions? Why do we use the uh, onshore normalization scheme for the uh, top quadrants? Why do we use what? Uh, onshore uh, renormalization. What's onshore normalization scheme? Uh, just uh, choose the, uh, the normalized mass to be the observed mass. Wait, sorry, I don't understand. So in renormalization condition, it's precisely that. You renormalize the mass at you you define the mass at that scale to what you've observed it. So that's renormalization. Renormalization scheme is just choosing the finite forms. Sorry, there, there, there are several things. There's a, what I just described is a renormalization condition. Renormalization scheme, the one that we advocated in this course was MS bar, right? Yes. MS bar is yeah, I don't I don't really know what the uh what do you call it? Unshell? You know, I don't know what that scheme is. I just only at least. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. But yeah, MS bar prime is the one that we have dealt with in this course. All right. Any other questions? I actually wonder, this is this is kind of interesting. I wonder if that has to do with non-perturbativeness of the physics. That might be the origin of it. All right, if not, uh, thank you so much, guys. I'll post some.